Hey, Jim, thank you very much. Hey, everybody, it's great to be with you today. I'm very excited about AEW Revolution. I think it's really cool. We're here four years exactly after the original revolution to celebrate what is, I think, one of AEW's greatest events and what has become one of the great traditions in pro wrestling. Hope everybody's having a great Leap Day. I hope Leap Day William has not visited any of you, and I look forward to answering your questions now on Revolution. Thank you very much. All right, Tony, thank you very much. So let's get after it. We're going to start today with Jim Barcelone from the Miami Herald. And after Jim and Tony connect, Dominic D'Angelo from Ad Free Shows will be next. Jim, you're up. Uh, thank you all. Just obviously just talking about Sting, what he's meant to everyone. And it's this big event. It's AEW Revolution, but it's also AEW Sting. <laughs> so just what are your thoughts of Sting and what, he, what he's meant to pro wrestling and what he's meant to AEW? It's a great question, Jim. I appreciate you leading off with that. Uh, I'm very excited about AEW Revolution, first and foremost, being Sting's last pro wrestling match and Sting's retirement. I think he's been a huge part of pro wrestling for my entire life. Uh, he's been a hero since I was very young. And when Sting came into AEW, I was so excited. And uh, this is exactly where I hoped we would get uh, setting up an incredible retirement match for Sting this Sunday at Revolution Pay-Per-View. He's an incredible pro wrestler and an incredible man and giving him the send off that he deserves these past few years has been really important to me. And now uh, having a match for the weekend with high stakes, a personal rivalry, a great story. It's going to be a tremendous show and it's got uh, certainly something that nobody will ever forget. And that is Sting's final wrestling match teaming with Darby Allen versus the young bucks. Uh, Sting is really important to all of us. In AEW, I think he's not only beloved backstage, but he's a hero to a lot of us, including myself personally. And I cannot wait for this weekend and specifically this Sunday in Greensboro for AEW Revolution. I think it's the perfect place to pay tribute to Sting's great career in the Greensboro Coliseum. It was where Sting really first arrived on the national map in 1988. And it was very fitting that he had his final appearance last night on TBS. I thought that went really well, and we had a great go-home show last night, and certainly Sting coming down from the rafters one last time I thought was a perfect way to cap off the final dynamite before Revolution and the final dynamite of Sting's career and a great way for Sting to make his last appearance ever on TBS, the Superstation, after... 37 years on TBS, and I've been saying 36 years on top, really going back to that match in 1988, but 37 years uh, having most of your career on one network and being so identifiable with it, it's pretty special and pretty rare, and it's befitting the great career and the great person that we have in Sting. Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Dominic D'Angelo from Ad Free Shows is next, and he will be followed by Steve Fall from WrestleNews.co. Dominic? Tony, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Great. Thank you. Oh, hey, awesome. Hey, okay. Looking forward to Revolution this uh, this coming weekend, and uh, obviously Sting's send-off, big send-off. Um, wanted to kind of get a question about Jennifer Pepperman and the hiring of her and what that means kind of for the creative structure backstage. Would you have a kind of a game plan in place for her and implementing her into the program from a weekly basis, and how will that kind of change the process of AEW moving forward? Well, it's another person in what I think is a good process. I love collaborating with the people in the, in the office, and uh, Jen is somebody who's got a really great wrestling mind. I was in the office very late last night working, I think, uh, you know, we have a different crew of people that come week to week to Dynamite versus Collision sometimes, and, and some people make it to both shows, and Jen has been at, at both shows with me, and along with a, a, a great group of people. Last night I was in the office very late until the wee hours of the morning, making sure we had a lot of details figured out. Jen was one of the people I had there with me, along with uh, Will Washington, Brian Danielson, Jimmy Jacobs, Mike Mansuri, and a lot of other people. Uh, we have a really strong group of, 
idea people and a great group of coaches. And it's really nice to have somebody like Jen, uh, who has experience in pro wrestling, but also a lot of experience in television. And, you know, it's, it's the same process with, um, more ideas and more people added into it. And Jen's been fitting in great. A lot of the people who had worked with Jen previously had really great things to say about her and my visits with her. I really liked her a lot. And she was very excited about what she'd seen in AEW and, uh, you know, she's, uh, fitting in great and I like working with her a lot. And so it's great to have another person uh, with great ideas and contributing, uh, in the room and, uh, She's learning uh, AEW, I think, day in and day out, more and more and more, and that that is tremendous. You know, we we've got, we've done a lot of shows now, and she's been doing a great job catching up on it. And I think also she brings a lot of knowledge of pro wrestling and television from outside AEW, and she's a really great person to have, I think, in that room in that process with us. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Dominic. Steve Fall from WrestlingNews.co is next, and Steve will be followed by Joel Torres from Contralona. Steve? Yes. Hey, Tony. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Happy leap year to you, leap day to you as well. Um, this weekend, Revolution is taking place in North Carolina, and born and raised in North Carolina is Camille, a former NWA Women's Champion, and free agency seems to be something you're very interested in. Has AEW been talking to Camille about coming in, and possibly could she be there at Revolution this weekend? Well, Camille's a great free agent in wrestling. Uh, never say never, but certainly Camille is uh, somebody we've scouted and I, somebody that I personally have a lot of respect for, and I've, I've enjoyed her matches and uh, have enjoyed when I've met her. So... Uh, she would certainly be a great fit in AEW at any time, and uh, certainly she's somebody we would definitely keep under consideration here. There you go, Steve. Thank you very much. Joel Torres from Contralona is next, followed by John Alba from Triller TV. Joel. Yes. Hi, how are you, Tony? Um, I just want to know, first of all, Congratulations uh, with everything that's going on with AW Revolution. I know this is going to be a very special night for you. I um, just want to know what will be Sting's status with AW after his last match? Will he still be part of the company at some ca uh, at some other capacity? Uh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that question one more time? Sure, sure. Uh, just want to know what will be Sting's status with AW after his last match this Sunday and will he still be part of the company at some other capacity? Got it. Yes. Uh, Sting, I hope, will remain with us in spirit forever. I believe he'll be affiliated with us. Last night, he joked he's going to come back and throw on the headset, and I would love that. I think we would all love for Sting to come back and be a part of the show, and uh, he's always welcome here. You know, one thing about Sting, when he did this comeback – I think especially the hardcore fans of wrestling who uh, know all, all the inner workings and details uh, of the wrestling industry may appreciate this. When Sting came back in 2020, he did not need the money. Uh, Sting is very, very well off and has earned a lot of money in his career and is taking care of it very well. And he's really, really, uh, a great person and he's made great investments and he does this because he loves it and he loves the fans and he wanted to have a great run in wrestling. And for these past three years, uh, that's exactly what we've done uh, a little over three years since he first arrived in AEW and revolution will mark exactly three years uh, since his return to the ring. So uh, for me, I would love to have Sting back in AEW anytime, and I know he said he would like to come back. Uh, we won't uh, hold him uh, or force him to come back at any point. Uh, it's not like we're, we've locked in dates where he's definitely going to be there or, or contracted him. I think it's going to be really nice after three years uh, of pushing himself and having the kind of longevity in his career that all wrestlers could aspire to and dream of. 
now is a great time for Sting to take time for himself and his family after this. And whatever the result is Sunday, I think Sting can take pride that he's had the most incredible final run I can ever remember so far. And uh, we're all very excited about the final match Sunday. And then after that, I think we'll have to see, see how Sting feels. And uh, I'm going to leave that to him, but he knows the door is open and he's welcome in AEW forever. And we definitely want Sting uh, representing AEW, I hope, for as long as there is an AEW, because to me, he's our greatest legend and he's been a part of so many of our greatest memories in the short history of AEW. And he's been in my lifetime, a part of so many of the greatest memories in all of pro wrestling in recent decades. And that's why I think he deserved that send off so much that he's getting right now. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. John Alba from Triller TV is next, followed by Samantha Shipman from the Daily DDT. John. Hey, thanks so much for making the time. Tony, I know it's a busy time. The combine going down. I can't wait to see your 40 time next year when you get a chance to uh, get out there and sprint. But uh, no, I, no. I, 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 I'm confident you could put out a good show there. But uh, I want to ask, you know, Revolution's kind of AEW's big Q1 event that you guys have every year. So looking ahead at Q2 and Q3, do you have any projections as to when there might be some sort of an update as to media rights deals domestically? And what's the current outlook on that, especially as we've heard talks recently with WBD and Paramount and some other entities as well? It's a great question. Uh, it's going to be an exciting year for us. I think first and foremost, we've got AEW Revolution, as you said. It's a huge event for us. Uh, and now, four-year anniversary of the original revolution. It's crazy. This is the fifth revolution, and it really represents the fifth time through the full pay-per-view cycle for us. And I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and speaking of cycles and, and meteorites and, and all of these great things, it's a big year for us out of the ring. It's going to be really important for us to... Uh, keep performing, keep having strong results. You know, we're coming off AEW Dynamite as the number one show on cable last Wednesday. We've had a really strong year uh, and strong results, strong set of finishes. We've done really well in comparison to other major sports leagues. Several times this year, AEW on Wednesday night to actually beaten the NBA straight up and in the demo. And uh, last week, Wednesday Night Dynamite, uh, beat everything on cable, and even including the network shows, was the number two show on all of television on Wednesday. Uh, really, really strong results. I think it's exciting for us going into Revolution this weekend to feel like there's a lot of great momentum around the company, but also uh, important to the company, the fans, and really everyone that works in AEW. We've got a huge opportunity coming up. AEW's media rights uh, will be negotiated this year, and we're in a great position. I think it's really exciting for the company and the fans going forward, and we've really been a great performer for TBS and TNT over the years, and it's a great relationship. And certainly when you look at the history of wrestling, I think it's very fitting. We're celebrating the great career of Sting and the history of Sting specifically on TNT and TBS, the Superstation. I really love that, and these facts are not lost on me. And also, I'm a very loyal person, and I really am very grateful for the opportunities we've gotten here. And I think it's a great place to be, Warner Brothers Discovery. And it's changed a lot in the time I've been there. You know, while we've been AW, and there's been consistency, and I've been at every show, and, uh, you know, the management has not change wholesale. You know, there's been uh, effectively consistency within the management of AEW, and there's been a lot of changes in Warner Brothers Discovery in these years. And right now, I think changes for AEW have been for the better. We've been able to expand our programming. It was under this administration led by David Zagloff and Bruce Campbell and the great team there 
where they've expanded, and it was under uh, Warner Brothers Discovery and under the TV networks led by Kathleen Finch and Jason Sarlanis, where they gave us this great opportunity, expanding the AW weekly programming from three hours to five hours, uh, adding to the original scope of our deal that consisted of two hours of AEW Dynamite plus AEW Rampage and adding in Collision. Some of the best wrestling matches, some of the best moments, and some of the best shows in all of wrestling in the past year have been on Collision. The show has brought in new audience and has given TNT a lift on Saturdays, and it's really given us a boost, too. It's made it possible to do all kinds of new things, including with five hours, much easier and much uh, more accessible to put on something such as the Continental Classic, which is one of my favorite things we've ever done in AEW, and still offering the, the great stories, still having the great matches uh, outside the tournament, and being able to then step out of the tournament and do something as special as building the Sting's final match in these recent months. It's very, very cool, and the opportunities have only grown and expanded under this management at Warner Brothers Discovery. So it's a, it's a great relationship that's only gotten better and better with the new management. And uh, I'm very optimistic about this year for AEW. And to be honest, looking forward, there's a lot to look forward to this year. There's a lot of really exciting things coming. I'm very excited for Revolution and the shows after that. I can promise you I have something very exciting. I'm, I'm very excited about for the fans in Atlanta. And, of course, people are buzzing about big business in Boston with good reason. And then we're heading to Toronto after that, and that's going to be tremendous as well. So, really, a big slate of shows coming up on tour, uh, a big year ahead for AEW. But first and foremost is this Sunday Revolution. I think we're all very, very pumped about that. And uh, that will really give us a lot of great momentum, I truly believe going into the big rights renewal year for AEW and all that entails for us going into the media rights renewals. Thank you for asking. Thanks, John. Samantha Shipman from the Daily DDT is next. And I'm going to follow Samantha with a write-in question from Kimmy Sokol from the Pop Break. But first, Samantha. Hi, Tony. How are you? I am great. Thank you. I'm doing tremendous. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, looking forward to uh, being in attendance for uh, Revolution this weekend. And so I wanted to go back to um, Jennifer Pepperman and her uh, experience that she brings. And so I've not obviously we've noticed uh, lately there's been a renewed focus on the women's division. So did that push you to hire a woman in creative to kind of uh, give her perspective on uh, women's stories? I think we were really excited about what has been happening. I've, I've really enjoyed working with the women in AEW and Ring of Honor this past year. And there is that vibe. Not only is it a vibe on TV, but it's a vibe in AEW and ROH. The women's locker room has never been more energized. And there have been great matches. There's great stories happening in AEW and ROH. And... I feel like the depth of talent has gotten stronger and stronger. Independently of that, trying to expand our team, I really like the people I work with, and we've added new people. Um, I mentioned a lot of the people in the office. You know, we have a great group of coaches. I love working with uh, the people on the coaching staff, including Sanjay, Sarah Stock, Pat, Buck, QT, Rocky Romero, uh, and so many others uh, on their individual ideas on the matches they're working on and then uh, taking a big view of the company. Of course, uh, we've got a bunch of great people with creative minds. You know, I mentioned I was in the office very late last night for hours after we shot Dynamite and Collision, just going through ideas and uh, spending time together drinking coffee with Will Washington, Jimmy Jacobs, Brian Danielson, Mike Mansuri, and now uh, I thought Jen Pepperman uh, adds a lot to any conversation she's in. And whether it's women's wrestling or men's wrestling, Jen Peppermans got great ideas and they are, they're not limited to any one match or any one story. I think she's 
got a really great mind, and now she spent years in wrestling. You know, I love the world of soap operas, and I think it's fascinating the work she's done. She's an Emmy Award winning filmmaker, and it's a very different medium, soap operas, but obviously there are similarities, and it was uh, a unique hire when she joined pro wrestling, and now she's learned the wrestling business. There are a lot of wrestlers that have great experience working with her, and so she was a popular hire. I think she adds a lot. Um, she would add a lot to any women's story. She can add ideas, but she also adds ideas to men's stories. I think any aspect of wrestling or television that you're working on, Jen can be insightful, and uh, she's very additive. So I wanted to bring Jen in to help just in, with AEW all across the board, and I think she's been doing a great job. So uh, really excited about what we're doing across the women's and men's wrestling in AEW, and uh, very excited to add another great person to the team backstage with Jen. Thank you. Thanks, Samantha. Here's a, I've got a write-in here from Kimmy Sokol, which I'll read here in a second. Amy Nemedy from WrestleJoy, I'd like for you to be on deck after Tony answers this question from Kimmy. This weekend, Daniel Garcia will have his first title match on pay-per-view. How excited are you for his match against Christian? That's an excellent question. I love working with Daniel Garcia. I think he's done an incredible, incredible job uh, building himself up and evolving since he arrived in AEW. I'm looking out at Daly's place right now, and uh, it's been, uh, I have to say, uh, feels like uh, it's been even longer, but it's been about three years since Daniel Garcia started working for us. And he first came in at Daly's place, and uh, I thought they would bring a lot to each other. And I paired up Daniel Garcia with a team that had been known as 3.0, and they'd been known as Everize, and they'd been known as 2.0. And I thought they would be good as 2.0 with Danny because I didn't want people to think that he was in the 3.0. <laughs> and if it's at 3.0, there's three of them, I thought people would think Daniel's in the tag team. Uh, I really love Daniel Garcia. I think he's uh, such a fantastic young man, and I think he's got a great passion for pro wrestling. And... He's really, really smart. He works really hard. He's incredibly likable, and he has a very bright future. I think the sky's the limit for Daniel Garcia. And what's really cool is if you look each year in AEW, he's evolved and gotten better. And when you look how young he is and look how he's built himself up, built his body, built a character, developed his mannerisms. He's had a connection with the crowd for years, and the crowd really cares about him. And wherever you go in the country, uh, I find he has that connection. I really am impressed with Daniel. And it's funny, we were in Huntsville last night, and I was, Again, I mentioned I, I stayed late after just to kick ideas around and brainstorm and hear out anybody who had any thoughts or anything we could work with. And I was telling a group of people, like I said, late at night, I think uh, you had, uh, um, like I mentioned, Brian Danielson, Will Washington, Jim Papperman, Jimmy Jacobs, Pat Buck, uh, and a number of people stuck around. And I was telling people, you know, we did this house show here, and I think – it's, it's a funny memory. We had been in Huntsville, Alabama for a house rules, and the main event was Daddy Magic and Daniel Garcia versus Orange Cassidy and Darby Allen. And uh, I remember the fans in Huntsville started chanting, you're a wrestler, Daniel Garcia, on a house show. And first of all, it, it, I was impressed with Huntsville, Alabama at the house show that you know, this is for a house show crowd throughout the night. They show they were very smart fans that watched the show very intricately and understood all the details of the show. And the timing of it when they did it, um, you know, it made me smile. And uh, going back to Huntsville for Dynamite and Collision last night with Daniel Garcia, 
on the verge of his first pay-per-view title shot with Daniel Garcia working uh, a big main event match on collision out there with all stars swimming in the deep end and having Daniel Garcia out there with some of our biggest names, including Christian cage and orange Cassidy. It was very, very cool. And, uh, I really, really think the sky's the limit for Daniel Garcia. He would be a great champion in any company, and in AEW, he would be a great champion for any title. I think the TNT title is all about uh, pro wrestling. We've seen so many great bell-to-bell wrestlers hold the title, uh, and I believe Daniel Garcia fits that tradition like a glove. And Christian Cage is also somebody that has been a great champion. He's done it a different way than anyone else who's ever held the title, but he has established himself as a great champion. I also have an incredible amount of personal respect for Christian Cage, who I believe might be the best wrestler in the entire world. And I'm glad that people have come to see that. There was a point maybe 18 years ago where I felt like there was momentum starting to build in that direction. And there have been various times over the years where I felt like there was, uh, that was becoming a trendy thing to say, but over the past couple of years, I don't think it's just a trendy thing to say. I think fans all over the world have seen it, that Christian does it as well as anyone. And he is certainly, as we stand, I believe one of the great villains in pro wrestling and also one of the great bell to bell wrestlers. And, I think that's a great match, Christian and Garcia. I can't wait to watch that at Revolution. And I think either one of them, Daniel Garcia or Christian Cage, is a great TNT champion coming out of this pay-per-view. And uh, as I've said, I think Daniel Garcia brings a lot to AEW. And I love working with him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kimmy. Amy Nemedy from WrestleJoy is next to be followed by Bill Pritchard from WrestleZone. Amy. Hi, Tony. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, thank you, Amy. Perfect. I've got a new setup, so I wasn't sure. Um, So I wanted to talk about Swerve Strickland, Hangman Page, and Samoa Joe. Now, Swerve and Hangman have been circling each other for the last six months, pulling each other into these pits of darkness with Swerve breaking into Hangman's home and threatening his son. And Hangman, in this pivotal moment at Dynamite in Phoenix, going into a complete descent into madness against Swerve Strickland. It seems like at this point, Hangman wants to take everything from Swerve. That said, they've got this incredibly imposing, intimidating, dominant force of a champion in Samoa Joe. So while their rivalry seems to be culminating at Revolution, it's culminating around a championship match with one of the hardest hitters who's nearly undefeated in his run in AEW. And as far as I can tell, neither of them have ever faced Samoa Joe in a singles match or in this kind of match. I think the only time they've actually mixed it up with each other was on February 21st. Um, So I wanted to know if you could talk about the stakes of this match, the odds for Joe, Hangman, and Swerve going into this match, and how this all came together as they clash at Revolution. Uh, It's a great match. I'm really excited about all three wrestlers. They're all at the top of the profession, and that's why it's a great world title match. Uh, it's hard to pick a number one contender when you have two great wrestlers that are red hot and a rivalry that's so red hot and, frankly, evenly matched like Hangman Page and Swerve Strickland. We've seen Hangman's, as, as we said, descent into madness. Uh, a bit, and Hangman playing mind games now, uh, and Swerve pushed Hangman too far, possibly. But the fans have really come to love Swerve, and Swerve's red hot. It's a really exciting time for him, and it's been fascinating to watch the change in those two great wrestlers. We've established two great number one contenders, And we have the most, the most professional, the most dominant, the most 
I just really uh, the, the most high quality champion you could have ever, ever hoped to ask for in Samoa Joe. And we're very fortunate to have a great world champion like Samoa Joe. And what we have right now is this exciting three-way picture that has been built up for weeks and weeks. Uh, it's been tremendous television, I think, watching Swerve and Hangman trying to outdo each other and seeing how personal the hatred between them is while Samoa Joe has established himself as this fantastic world champion. So far, AEW has been on a really hot run in recent months. Since the start of 2024, and I think we ended on a great note with the Continental Classic and a lot of the great things we did to end 2023. And going going into 2024, I felt like we had a lot of positive momentum. And Samoa Joe walking into the new year as a world champion has been fantastic. And now, as you said, it's this first-time match, first-time encounter, first-time uh, hangman or swerve is at a chance to challenge Samoa Joe for the championship or even really get into that kind of a singles match type situation with Samoa Joe. As you mentioned, the first time they were all out there together for a match was uh, that six-man tag match, that trios match uh, that was really exciting and put us on this path to revolution. I think it's a great world title match. There's so many exciting things to look forward to on Sunday's pay-per-view and certainly uh, – one of the top things, one of the top matches I'm looking forward to is the three-way championship bout, Samoa Joe versus Hangman Page versus Swerve Strickland. should be a great show, and I think that's going to be a great match. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amy. Bill Pritchard from Russell Zone is next. Paul Berry is on deck from Newsweek. Bill? Hi, Tony. How are you? Hey, Bill, doing great. How are you, man? Doing good. So I wanted to ask about the Meat Madness match being pulled from the card. I know last night you said that uh, you were dealing with some injuries um, and you were putting the match on ice, but three of the advertised names are in the new Scramble match. So I was wondering if you could talk about how big the original match was supposed to be or if you could talk about some of the injuries that you're dealing with in, in that match? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I first thought of the meat madness match. and I'm glad you asked. I first thought of the meat madness match and that it would be something really fun for the fans based on the, the fan feedback and the, something the fans brought to the show. I think it's one of the great things about AEW is I try to listen to the fans and, and if I'm not hearing you as the fans, then I'll keep listening, and sooner or later you're going to get through to me. You can always believe that. And uh, I'm always trying to listen to what the fans are saying, and certainly, literally, the fans were telling us during All Out, which, you know, this past year's All Out was one of the best shows we've ever done in AEW and is considered an all-time great pay-per-view. And there were a lot of great moments throughout the show, different moments, special moments. And one great thing about the card was, Miro versus Powerhouse Hobbs and the re the reaction they got. And it exemplified the spirit of that card. People weren't sure what to expect going into AEW All Out. It was the first year we had done All In and All Out, and the card really delivered. It ended up being a tremendous show, and everyone who came to the show or ordered it, the feedback was overwhelmingly positive and it was one of the best reviewed wrestling shows of the year and one of the best reviewed shows we've ever had and one of the great moments on the show was Miro versus Powerhouse Hobbs and the meat chance from Chicago I don't think these were just isolated to Chicago then we went on the road and, and in other big man matches we had them uh, so we had uh, meat forever chance during Miro versus Hobbs at all out and then we had uh, a great match on Collision. I think it was in December. And it was Brian Cage versus Keith Lee. And it was on a really strong episode of the show. I believe it was around the Continental Classic. And this was a great show that had lots of good matches on it. And then also a match outside of the tournament. Big men, 
Keith Lee versus Brian Cage, and the crowd really enjoyed that. Um, now, I wanted to put a lot of the big wrestlers uh, and get the crowd fired up for a multi-man scramble, a, a meat madness match. And I think the crowd would enjoy it and it would be a lot of fun, but some of the wrestlers I was hoping to use, including some of the wrestlers I just named, who would be, you know, the Miro versus Hobbs chant uh, and the Keith Lee versus Brian Cage. Right now, you know, they're two great wrestlers in AEW. Just an example, Miro and Keith Lee are both out. Neither one is available. Um, and some of our big men being out injured, I wanted to have the depth in the field to do the match I'd really originally envisioned, and I think people would enjoy that, but it's a great opportunity. I think we have, we had named Hobbs, Archer, and, uh, of course, Wardlow in the card, and, and with Hobbs, Wardlow, and Archer, they're not only three great big man wrestlers, but they've all had great experiences in AEW. They've all been in great big main event matches and uh, wrestled on the TVs and the pay-per-views, and uh, I thought having them involved would be great. But uh, since we didn't necessarily have the, the depth and uh, we're missing some of our big guys to do the Meat Madness multi-man scramble, I think you know it's a great opportunity. Also, we have some other great stars and rivalries in AEW we can showcase. Um, so instead, I made it an all-star scramble, and it should be a fun match. And when we get all of our big men healthy at the same time, I still really want to take the meat madness concept off the shelf and get it out of the freezer and uh, thaw it out. Uh, but until then, uh, I put the meat madness on ice. Thank you, Bill. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul Berry from Newsweek is next. Paul will be followed by Dave Meltzer from Wrestling Observer. Paul. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the time, Tony. Um, you mentioned Sting's left us with a uh, ton of great memories. Sting was a huge part of my fanship of professional wrestling. I wanted to ask you what your first memory of Sting, where he really left an impression uh, on you, and what it was about his work that connected with you personally. The first WCW show, thank you for the question, the first WCW show I ever saw was Super Brawl 1, and my parents made dinner, I believe it was a Sunday night, and it was in the middle of 1991, and I was eight years old, and the first match I actually flipped on uh, was Dustin Rhodes versus Terry Taylor, and I had seen Dustin Rhodes before uh, wrestling on TV, and uh, you know, I'd grown up watching the WWF until uh, for the first few months and then started to expand and watch other wrestling. And so when I was eight years old, the first WCW show I ever saw was Super Bowl One, And uh, the, the match I had really been looking forward to on the show from reading magazines and reading about the people in the match was the Steiner Brothers versus Lex Luger and Sting. And... Sting, Lex Luger, and Ric Flair got tons of write-ups in the wrestling magazines that I would read in the supermarket, but I hadn't seen them yet. And I was pretty uh, articulate on the satellite when I was a kid and proficient at finding just about anything. So uh, I was able to find Super Brawl 1 and find a, a stream of that. And uh, then... Uh, I was so excited when they showed, the, and if, you, if you've seen Super Bowl one and you, you remember the Steiners versus Sting and Lex Luger, you might remember there was a video right before the match with an instrumental song playing, showing highlights of Sting and Lex in the Steiners. Uh, and then they went out there and had something unlike I'd seen, which was this like really hard-hitting babyface tag match, and it, it was one of the best matches in 1991, I think, and it left a lasting impression on me, and it was Sting and Lex Luger versus the Steiner brothers, and I wanted to see more of all four, and in particular Sting. And then later that year, uh, there was, uh, of course, a Clash of the Champions show that was one of my favorite shows. It featured Sting versus Rick Rude, and... Arn Anderson and Larry Zbysko versus Dustin Rhodes and 
a replacement mystery partner. Barry Wyndham was out injured, and the replacement mystery partner was Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Uh, and uh, then uh, I remember, I've said this to Sting before, my sister's fourth birthday uh, when I was nine years old. Uh, at my sister's fourth birthday, uh, I was really getting yelled at and pulled away to go uh, spend more time at the celebration of my sister's birthday and not watching the Sting and Ricky Steamboat versus Rick Rude and Steve Austin match on TBS uh, on the Clash of the Champions on January 21st, 1991. Uh, lots of memories like that. I'm a big fan of Sting, and uh, he's been a huge influence in my life and really the ultimate pro wrestling hero. He's one of my all-time favorites, and I'm really excited that we'll be able to pay a great tribute to Sting this weekend and give Sting uh, a great final match and hopefully uh, have this three-year run from Revolution 2021 to Revolution 2024 really be a special memory for the wrestling fans. And, of course, I want it to be uh, something special for Sting, first and foremost. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Okay, we got about 15 minutes to cur curfew, so Dave Meltzer from the Wrestling Observer is next, and after that I'm going to follow with a write-in question from Lyric Swinton from SNME Radio. Dave. You hear me? Yeah, hi, Dave. Yeah, okay. Um, hey, Tony, so I was just wondering, um, can, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear you great, Dave. Okay, great, great. Yeah, I was wondering, like, as far as, like, your uh, projections, you know, as far as the economics of the company for 2024, I mean, do you have any, are you kind of close to a number of pay-per-views you're planning this year? And as far as profitability and everything, you know, how close do you feel you can come this year? And, uh, and um, you know, what kind of goal, what kind of goals do you have, basically, for, for 2024? It's a great question, Dave. Thank you. Um, well. First of all, on pay-per-views, last year we expanded the calendar very successfully. You've written probably more about that than anybody, that it was really a highlight of our business this past year, expanding the pay-per-view calendar the past few years. We launched AEW in 2019, and through the first full year, uh, that first pay-per-view cycle was really four events, and we successfully added a fifth, fifth event in 2022 with Forbidden Door, and that was the biggest debut of any of our events at that point. And uh, then this year we expanded that calendar again and went from five events to eight. And again, it was very successful. Uh, there was, I think it was a, a very proper amount of saturation. It was well saturated, uh, at, appropriately saturated. And uh, at eight events, we saw record results. and the additions of All In, our biggest event ever, uh, that would then, for it being AEW's first All In, it would be the biggest debut of any of our events now, uh, and then a great debut for Wrestle Dream, uh, an event I felt really strongly about and have a personal connection to, and it was really special to me and a lot of the wrestlers in AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling for us to go out there and for AEW to pay tribute to the late great Antonio Inoki, uh, without whom I really believe we all might not be here right now, and then closed the year with AEW World's End, which was an incredibly successful pay-per-view event. So going to eight events, it worked really well. I believe we have the capacity to increase. I think this year, I would, if, 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 if you forced me to say, uh, to use an expression I, I use in the back a lot, I wait, if you force me to say, if I had to say, uh, I would probably, and I, and I don't have to say, so, <laughs> but, but, I, but I, I want to be open and honest. I could see this year being uh, 9 to 10, and I think 9 is probably a good sweet spot, uh, but it feels like that's about the right number, and I don't want to make a, a, a huge change or increase, but definitely 8 was incredibly successful, and I don't want to, do anything totally different, but I do see an opening for nine probably and maybe 10, but nine feels like a great number for us right now, particularly when you also consider I put on three 
Ring of Honor streaming events annually. That puts you with AEW doing really our strongest nine possible events, plus these three events that have a great tradition. I think they were ROH's three strongest events, which is why I've kept them in the rotation. And, and now those are different. Those aren't really pay-per-views. Those are streaming events. Um, but uh, I do think it's going to be a great year for us. If we, uh, you know, we, we, we do get a, a bump annually, so our rights fees are better in 24 than they were in 23, but the really big bump uh, by a lot more than that is going to be in 25. And I, I'm very excited about the upcoming media rights renewal deal. That will uh, really put us over the top in many ways into, not in the, into going from being a milestone business that has accomplished things that will live in the history books and uh, a great business to being what I think will be a uh, sustainable business for many, many years to come. And that will be the new media rights we, we do, which will really uh, be the biggest source of revenue we've ever injected into the company. And we've grown our revenues year over year. Uh, and as we've expanded, I think it's been a really, really, really uh, bold and a competent and I think now justified in the boldness and confidence of these moves to expand the pay-per-view calendar and expand uh, our TV production. The pay-per-view calendar, it's in the pudding. The numbers are there. You can see it's really worked for us. We do some of the best events in pro wrestling. It's a great value. I believe the AEW pay-per-views and I've kept the cost of the events uniform over the years. And when you plop down that money on that weekend to buy the big AEW pay-per-view event, I think we have a very good history of delivering great shows. And now, the business track record is there too. Uh, our events have done very, very well. And this past year in expanding the calendar, we really grew again, not only grew the number of events we did, but really grew the revenue. And that proved to be a great move. We also made a, a huge, huge leap by adding AEW collision. I believe that risk we took and that uh, leap uh, and, the, and like I said, the boldness and confidence it takes to do those things, I think that has been realized in terms of the quality of the show, and it's been realized in terms of the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, I think in the past year on AEW Collision, we've had some of the best moments, some of the best matches, and some of the best all-around two-hour shows in all of pro wrestling. And I think the biggest opportunity lies in the media rights renewal uh, where dynamite rampage and collision will all be getting huge, huge increases. I can say for sure. And now going into that and having, like I said, that confidence, uh, I think 25 is going to go down as the year uh, where AEW really took the leap from being a startup company to being the established challenger player in pro wrestling for decades to come and establishing all that in basically five years, that was the five-year plan. And sitting here in, in the same place where we started it five years ago in Jacksonville, Florida, and being here in the same office looking at Daily's Place right now, uh, it's really, really exciting and it's really rewarding to look back at that. So, yeah, I, I think that media rights renewal coming up, it, that's going to be the key thing on the TV side and on the pay-per-view side. Most of the expansion has happened, and it's been successful. It, and now, you know, I think we've, it's like uh, it's like with a pizza. Like, you know, we found most of the places we're going to put the cheese in the pizza. It'll be years before they find more places to put cheese in a pizza. <laughs> but So I'm not going to try to stuff a lot more cheese in it. But uh, uh, I do think pay-per-view-wise we've kind of found a good, a good place. But I think also by expanding, it's, it's really helped us. So thank you. As you can tell, I love talking about the business side of it too. Uh, 
almost as much as I love talking about the wrestling side of it and having uh, Sting's retirement match at the Greensboro Coliseum on Sunday. So thank you, Dave. Thanks, Dave. So we're going to finish with a write-in from Lyric Swinton from SNME Radio. And if there's time, Brandon Thurston from WrestleNomics. So, Tony, the question from Lyric uh, is, we've seen a big renewed focus on the women's division as of late, including the impending AEW Big Business. So can we expect to see a women's face of the revolution match or possibly a women's Continental Classic tournament? Oh, these are great questions. I think uh, we're building that depth in the division and getting to where we're having better and more consistent matches. It took us years and years as a company to get to where we were able to have uh, the Continental Classic because the quality of the wrestling and the depth of the wrestling has gotten to, I think, an all-time high on the men's side. Now on the women's side, it's really taken that lead, too. So it's about having the consistency of the matches and uh, the quality of the wrestling week to week in that consistency. And I think we've been getting better and better there. So we're taking great steps. Uh, Very excited about some of the great matches we've had on TV lately and some of the great wrestlers. I think Chris Statlander and Sky Blue last night was an excellent match. And I thought that uh, really uh, on Rampage, a very underrated match was Anna Jay versus Mariah May last week. I think we've got a great match coming up with Rio versus Trisha Dora. And there's a lot of great things happening in the AEW women's division and in the ROH women's division. We have a great world champion in Athena. Athena continues to deliver on ROH great matches and uh, a great tournament field and exciting matches happening right now in the ROH women's TV title tournament. I think uh, when the consistency is there where we can put out good matches week to week to week. I would love uh, to be able to uh, expand those match types and try that in the women's division, which is getting better and better each week. And I think everyone's seeing that. And just based on the questions I'm getting, basically every question is acknowledged. The, the, the matches and uh, the shows around the women's division have gotten better and better. So it's really exciting times there. And for all of us in AEW, a lot of exciting things happening for everyone and, and definitely for the women's division in AW and ROH right now. Thank you, Lyric. Okay, with three minutes to go, the final question and the time for the answer uh, will be Brandon Thurston from WrestleNomics. Brandon? Uh, I was wondering if you, if you could tell us who the members are of AW's discipline committee and do those members have experience in, in how to handle uh, sexual misconduct claims that they come off? Uh, well, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, um, we have, uh, you know, trained uh, professionals on the discipline committee, um, including uh, two attorneys and Brian Danielson. And Brian, they're different backgrounds, and that's the idea, to have uh, people from different backgrounds and different experiences in uh, wrestling, which is certainly its own unique business with its own unique set of challenges. And I think I want people that have common goals for the company and for the well-being of the wrestlers and also people that share high integrity. And the attorneys that I chose and Brian Danielson, I think that's a really strong group of people. Uh, and they would be looking out uh, against all misconduct claims, and we've tried to train them up uh, to do their best, I think, to really, whatever the situation is in terms of misconduct, to do whatever it takes to ensure the well-being of the wrestlers, which is first and foremost here above everything else. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. <clears throat> and that'll do it for today. Tony, do you have any uh, closing thoughts? Yeah, this one is uh, very special to me. I think it's the most special event in the history of AEW for me personally. And it's the first time uh, for me uh, it's ever felt so personal to have Sting's last match and have it be in AEW and to have, you know, that's, that's amazing to begin with. But now having spent 
over three years with Sting and having Sting wrestling in AEW regularly for these past few years and getting to know Sting and getting to know Steve behind the paint. He's an incredible person, and he's one of the all-time greatest wrestlers, and we're a young wrestling company, AEW. I think the fact that Sting has come to AEW and had a run that will all be, always be remembered by his loyal fans and a run that uh, will culminate in a final match that I think will be a great match and a show that top to bottom includes matches. And in particular, I think really eight matches uh, that have had a lot of established television story build a lot of great matches that helped get to those eight matches. And then also within the scramble, some rivalries that I'm looking forward to showcase and some stars uh, should be, be also a very fun match. And uh, I think top to bottom, it's been our best built pay-per-view really for weeks. The focus has been on these matches and stories. And I think it's been one of our best builds to a pay-per-view there's something about revolution. It feels like there's always a lot of excitement and buzz going into this event. And the first revolution in Chicago is one of my favorite events we've ever done. We've had great revolution shows all over the country, coast to coast. But never before have I been more excited for revolution or for any show as I am for this Sunday. And thank you all very much for joining for the media call. Thank you, Jim and Robin and Mandy, for helping organize this. Uh, and I'm very grateful to all of you and really looking forward to Sunday's Revolution pay-per-view, probably more than anything we've ever done. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Tony. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, we're now at the end of our time. So as normal, we're going to be distributing an audio recording to all attendees shortly. Uh, so with that, we thank you again for being part of today's call and obviously for your faithful coverage of AEW and the entire world of professional wrestling. So with that, we're looking forward to seeing you Sunday night in Greensboro for Revolution and elsewhere throughout uh, 2024. Have a great leap day. Cheers.